delighted to welcome you to this session of the 15th Jaipur Literature Festival, protected by Deton, Banega's first India. It is our pleasure to present today, Lost in the Valley of Death, Harley Rusted, in conversation with Anisha Lalwani. Lost in the Valley of Death, the alluring Himalayas have for centuries beckoned travelers in search of spiritual awakening. Harley Rusted's gripping new work, Lost in the Valley of Death, a story of obsession and danger in the Himalayas chronicles the fate of Justin Alexander Shetler, his enthralling expedition across the globe, and the mystery of his disappearance in the remote and storied Parvati Valley, at once dark, dangerous, and source of enlightenment. In conversation with Anisha Lalwani, Rusted discusses the spiritual journey from which Shetler never returned and the universal human quest for fulfillment. Harley Rusted. Harley Rusted is the author of Lost in the Valley of Death, a story of obsession and danger in the Himalayas, and The Big Lonely Doug, the story of one of Canada's last great trees. He's a features editor at The Walrus Magazine and is originally from Salt Spring Island, British Columbia, Canada. Anisha Lalwani. Anisha Lalwani is a research consultant at Sattva, a social impact consulting firm. She has worked in the development sector at Tata Institute of Social Sciences, and has editorial and marketing experience working with Yoda Press and the Jaipur Literature Festival. She has also worked in communications and programming at the Rangashankara Theatre in Bengaluru, and is currently working on a novel exploring the complexities of living in modern India. Please feel free to send in your comments by typing them in the comment section. Do follow our social media handles to get notifications on the upcoming sessions. Ladies and gentlemen, Lost in the Valley of Death, Harley Rusted in conversation with Anisha Lalwan. Over to you, Anisha. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Anisha Lalwani, and I'm going to be speaking with Harley Rustad, who's written an absolutely fascinating book uh, about the life of Justin Alexander Shetler, um, who was uh, a fascinating, absolutely fascinating character who got lost in, in the Parvati Valley, or uh, the Valley of Death. Um, so it's a very detailed, uh, very painstakingly put together book. Um, and and it, it's, of course, rooted in Justin's own personal story, but it's it covers so much more. It, it talks about, uh, you know, the spiritual draw that India has to Westerners and how they lose themselves in India or find themselves in India. The conflicts between being a, a traveler and being footloose and and so and being a social media influencer that Justin was. Um, the sort of spirit of solitude and wanting to push oneself further uh, to pursue adventure and freedom. Um, so I thought it would be interesting, um, uh, Harley, if we could start with a bit of a reading, um, if, if that's all right with you. Something, any passage that you feel sort of captures the essence of Justin's spirit a little bit, just to set the tone uh, for the rest of the conversation, just for about five minutes. Okay, so I'm going to read um, from the prologue. Uh, which is this opening scene uh, set in the Parvati Valley um, in the middle of, of Justin's time there when he has found this cave uh, and has been living in it for about, about three weeks. And I think it kind of sets the scene um, uh, quite well. The traveler had all that he needed inside his cave. It wasn't much, but enough to survive. He reclined against the granite wall, bare back meeting cold stone. He had collected fallen wood, anything half dry from the forest around his cave. Stripping some logs into kindling with his machete and setting about lighting a fire. He positioned it near the mouth of the cave so the noxious smoke would dissipate into the night and animals would be deterred from entering. He opened a book. There was just enough light in which to read. It was a book about the search to find happiness in the world. His cave lay deep in the forest in the Indian Himalayas, a half day's walk from the nearest village or the nearest road, near the head of a slender valley. There were dozens of caves in this forest that had formed in the lee of boulders or by great stones fracturing apart to create caverns. Many caves were tall enough in which to stand and long enough in which to lie down. Some boulders were said to have been dropped by the gods as who else could move such colossi of stone while others had been left behind by similarly powerful forces of nature, great glaciers that had retreated up the valley long, bef long before. Many people had walked by, 
had walked by these caves without a second glance. But over the years, pilgrims and travelers of a certain type had found sanctuary in them, refuge from the elements or the world beyond. This traveler had sought out a cave. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Yeah, I think that really captures kind of the, the essence of Justin and the, the essence of this book. So actually, initially, I, I was very curious when I started reading the book. I was wondering what drew you to this story? What drew you to Justin? Because as you mentioned, you know, there are so many people who have got lost from all over the world in Parvati Valley. So what drew you to Justin? I think what drew me to uh, him specifically in his story was that it it encapsulated a lot of these forces that I had been interested in for a very long time, um, which was kind of the darker side of tourism around the world and specifically uh, in India. And, but also some of the forces that draw people to India about, above all other places in the world. Um, and what happens to them when they arrive? What, what changes do they expect and what changes occur? And, and that interest in me was rooted in, in kind of a long family history. My dad traveled to India in the, in the late 1960s, you know, was there at the same time as the Beatles were in Rishikesh. Yeah. And so I grew up kind of inundated with these stories of adventure, you know, of the hippie trail, of, of spiritual quests, all those kinds of things. And when I first went there, I first traveled to India in, in 2008, 2009, um, for about a year as kind of one of these classic post-university graduates. I don't know what I want to do with my life, so I'll go to India and hopefully find some answers uh, kind of trip. Yeah. And it was then when I, one, started writing, but also started to become much more fascinated in some of these forces that draw people there. And Justin, when I came across his story, um, shortly after he disappeared uh, in, in you know, the late summer, early fall of 2016, his story, his character, embodied a lot of these issues that I was really fascinated in and set in a place, the Parvi Valley, that I had heard about on that first trip as being this incredibly beautiful place, but that is also a place that has a very dark, um, uh, complicated history to it. So his story, um, you know, for a journalist to come across uh, this occurrence, I just had a, a million questions I wanted to answer. Right, right. Okay. Um, so while reading the book, um, you talk about various conflicts that Justin goes through, right? He, he has a lot of tensions inside him. So there's one tension, one specific tension um, about him feeling like he was sort of pawning off his adventures uh, without fully living them. Um, so I wanted to know if, if you think that this is a conflict that you find a lot with travelers who are sort of full-time travelers who are constantly on the road, but also, uh, you know, social media influencers, social media stars. Uh, and you also mentioned the fact that he slightly bends his truth a little bit to fit in with the image. Um, and also that he felt pressure to amplify his adventure to keep his audience engaged, right? So I was just wondering if you can speak a little bit more to this conflict, to this, this, this specific tension and the, the lifestyle that Justin created for himself and the, the projection of it um, and the, you know, the tussle for authenticity. Um, yeah, can you speak a little bit uh, for, on that, please? Sure. So Justin was this really interesting character that he was born in, in Florida in, in the U.S., but kind of grew up in this survivalist nature awareness um, uh, education system. And so a huge part of his history was rooted in, in you know, connection to nature uh, and surviving in the wild and learning the skills and having that appreciation for it. But as he grew older, he, he kept that part of him, but he also you know, opened an Instagram account in 2013 and opened a Facebook account and a specific page devoted to, to, you know, his persona as a traveler and started a blog and really occupied these two worlds as somebody who really sought freedom and really sought independence. Uh, and that kind of expression that you only get from being a solo traveler, for example but also occupied the world that was predominantly online and all of the complications and forces that, that are exacted on somebody who has an, a growing following. And, and Justin, over time, the more he traveled, uh, the bigger his following became. And to tens of thousands of people had, you know, people watching his YouTube videos and, and a large following on Instagram and Facebook. And I think by that very nature, it's, it, it was impossible for him not to be affected by the power of an audience. 
And I think he knew that there was an enormous power there, a very positive, in some ways, power to inspire people to share stories of adventure, even if they are potentially more extreme than, than what most people might want to get into, but to inspire them and to tap into something really deep rooted about uh, seeking and fulfilling what you really want to do in life and asking some hard questions that I think a lot of us dwell on, but not many actually seek the answers. And so he really straddled these two worlds, had, had a foot in each, and towards the end really started to question whether or not he was doing these adventures, whether he was, uh, you know, climbing the Brooklyn Bridge in New York or, or you know, hiking off uh, to Mantelai Lake, you know, the most extreme part of the Parvati Valley, um, which was his, his final fateful journey, whether he was doing these extreme adventures for himself because he, he deeply knew that he wanted to do them and he, and he wanted personally to get something out of them or whether or not they were going to be a glamorous story that was going to get a lot of likes and a lot of attention, a lot of followers online. And I think he really struggled with that, um, that, that straddling of those, of those two worlds. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The struggle is very apparent in the way that you write it. And it's very kind of visceral. Um, another thing that uh, was interesting for me to read was that you mentioned uh, how Justin himself mentioned many times to, you know, his friends, his acquaintances on the road, etc., that he was not really looking to renounce the world. You know, he was not looking for emancipation. Uh, so in, in your own understanding, why do you think he followed that specific Baba uh, and you know what what was it that sort of inspired him to go to Mantalai Lake um, and to pursue such an extreme goal uh, in in your opinion and your mm -hmm. yeah what what is it if it if not emancipation if not renunciation yeah it's a, it's a really interesting question because I I think a lot of people um, might looked at his story and might look at this book and make a comparison to Christopher McCandless, who is the yeah. character in Into the Wild, John Krakauer's uh, book, Into the Wild, um, who is somebody who really wanted disconnection, who really, obviously Instagram didn't exist back in the early 90s, but uh, really wanted to disconnect from the world and you know, cut off connection with his family uh, and, and really with most people in his, in his, you know, from his, his teenage years and his childhood. Um, and really kind of set out on this new path to create a, a new person. You know, he invented his own, this own name, Alexander Supertramp, McCandless did. But Justin saw that there was, there was validation in trying to do both things. One, to cut himself off from the world. And he did that. He, you know, when he got to the Parvati Valley, he almost instantly went up to Kirganga, which is this um, kind of pilgrimage destination uh, that has these holy hot springs, you know, a long, long history associated with Shiva, and it's kind of the end of, or it's kind of the last base camp before the high wilderness, before you head off to Manslai Lake. And he spent no cell reception. He spent three weeks living in a cave there. So he, he wanted that disconnection, but he also deeply valued uh, the connection that he got online. And, and, and so when it came time to uh, to kind of, for me to kind of think about all of these questions about what were his motivations, what was he after? Um, I think in large part, it was no, there was no simple answer. Um, it was not like he was one of those sort of classic cases of somebody who arrives in India, forsakes their belongings in their previous life and steps into a new world uh, without looking back. Uh, he was somebody that was at the precipice of that, was sort of in, stepping up to the doorway of potentially that type of question. Uh, and that type of result. And so when he met this, this sadhu in Kirganga while he was living in his cave, uh, who, which was the person who invited him on this, this pilgrimage to Mantalai Lake, uh, which is about a four day hike um, from Kirganga up the valley and then had planned on staying there for a few weeks and then a, you know, a, a return journey. Um, this sadhu represented a lot of things that appealed to Justin all the way back to his, his kind of mentors that he looked, he looked up towards um, in his teenage years and in his childhood as somebody who offered wisdom and somebody who had was sort of this physical embodiment and personification of that very austere path towards a higher understanding. And so I think he saw that as much as he liked the gratification that he got from, from being 
you know, a minor uh, social media influencer. Um, but he also saw that there could be an enormous value uh, in following somebody who has set themselves on such an austere path to see what could be fine, to see what could be found at the end. Right. Yeah. So relatedly, I mean, I, I was also wondering, I had a separate question on why, uh, which you sort of partly answered in a way is why, why Justin was so enamored with this specific Baba, uh, despite the fact that, you know, a lot of his friends, acquaintances found him to be rough, aggressive, shady, very transactive, uh, very unlike, you know, the other Babas around uh, and some of the other sadhus around, given the fact that Justin was so well-traveled, he had met uh, shamans and, uh, you know, priests and had been in ayahuasca ceremonies, etc. In, in South America. Um, what is it that kind of, why was he so enamored by this Baba? I think there was a couple of reasons. I think on a very kind of deep fundamental level, Justin always was looking for a kind of father figure in his life. Mm. And his parents separated when he was, when he was a, young, a young boy in elementary school and his mother predominantly raised him. And he had a very complicated kind of on off relationship with his father throughout his teenage years and throughout his twenties. Yeah. And, and well, while Justin entered into these, these wilderness schools, these survival schools as a teenager, he latched on to these, these kind of gurus of that world and, and really hoped, and they became these kind of father figures for him. And I think he really hoped that, that they would occupy that place that he had longed for um, in the absence of kind of a strong uh, father figure or a stable father figure throughout his life. Um, and so when he met the, the, the sadhu, I think in some ways he, this person represented that kind of father figure, uh, somebody who can guide you, somebody who can give you uh, the right answers or at least kind of steer you onto the right path. And, you know, for centuries, people have gone to India looking for those people. They've gone looking for those gurus to help them answer a very simple question or answer a very complicated problem. And, and the sadhu kind of represented a lot of things uh, in, that, in that arena, was not only that father figure that he longed for deeply, but was somebody who, who you know, their entire aura, which has partly been built up, um, you know, in North America and in Europe as, as being these you know, sources of really great knowledge. And obviously currently that's, it, it's more complicated, um, but it's a very enticing prospect to, to become uh, a disciple, to become a chela of, of a sadhu. Um, and I think also partly Justin fell into a bit of a romanticization uh, of, of, a, of the sadhu, um, yeah. that this person, you know, held this exalted status uh, as, you know, as an, as an ascetic wanderer uh, and, and kind of bestower of, of knowledge um, and really wanted that romantic story of following a sadhu into the mountains uh, on a pilgrimage. Right. Yeah, interesting. Um, so sort of relatedly, you, you, you have a very, very interesting sort of observation in the book, which is about, you know, Westerners or young hippie backpackers sort of in general who travel to India, where they kind of, you mentioned that there's an intense pressure to experience profound moments of realization in India, in, in sort of, so in the short time span that they're in India, they're kind of extremely pressurized to, to you know, to experience these spiritual uh, enlightened moments. I was wondering if you think that it is this that in fact uh, creates the, you know, the India syndrome that you mentioned several times. And also we can speak a little bit about the India syndrome. Yeah, it's a really fascinating uh, concept and notion. And uh, so basically in, in the early or mid, uh, mid 80s, excuse me, um, a French psychiatrist was post, uh, positioned uh, in the French consulate uh, in Bombay. And he began noticing these changes in French travelers who were arriving in India and then the transformations that they, they underwent over their months. Uh, and he would see them before they flew back to France. And he began noticing these, in some cases, quite dramatic changes in people. Uh, and he wrote this book called Food Land or Crazy About India um, that uh, really put forth this notion that later became known as India Syndrome, which is not a 
clinical diagnosis necessarily, but kind of more an observation of behavioral changes that people uh, undergo when they, when they visit India specifically. Mm. And on the benign end, it, it can be kind of extreme culture shock that somebody comes with this notion that they can experience something profound and, or they expect India to be a certain thing and it is different. It is, it is not, or it is, it is, it is different. Um, and those people can become very disheartened, disoriented, and, and all the kind of more classic culture shock um, things that we, we know very well um, can become quite dangerous in, in some cases. Um, and on the more extreme end, you have people who, who land there and become so uh, enamored with uh, the spirituality, with uh, sadhus or, or ashrams, and completely renounce their belongings and stay there forever. And I met some people when I went there in, in 2009, I met a, a, a Swedish traveler who had, had uh, he was on the banks of the Ganges River living in a cave, you know, not unlike, unlike Justin did, um, who had burnt his passport and had never returned back to Sweden, been there for seven years. And there's lots of stories, uh, several of, you, of, of which I include in the book about people who've done something similar. Um, and so it became this really fascinating concept and, and big question for me was, was you know, how much of what happened to Justin in these months that he spent in India, how much of that fell under the umbrella, the big umbrella of India syndrome? What did he bring with him? The questions that he had, the previous um, kind of traumas that he carried with him or questions or, or uh, things he sought how much of, of that guided him to what, what eventually happened or how much was it India itself? And I think that uh, the author of Foodland asked this really provocative question that I'm, I'm gonna translate from French, but it's basically, you know, does India attract crazy people or does, or does India, you know, make people go crazy? Um, crazy is not the most appropriate term, but um, that's the one he uses in his book. And, and that's a really interesting question for me. And it became the framing of, of one chapter was, was you know how much of what draws us, how much of our expectation, uh, then translates to experience uh, when when people land in India, or how much of is it India itself that that forces these transformations, because it is a, a challenging place for a lot of people to visit um, sometimes. And yeah, and uh, yeah, mm, yeah. No, that, I mean, I think th those passages were some of the most interesting for me because it looks at, you know, the, the, the sort of the, the larger lens of, of traveling in general and, and the draw that India has in general. And having visited a lot of these places, including Malana, et cetera, myself, um, I, could, I could sense, I mean, I could, you can sense those things there sort of in the air. Um, I mean, I, I went a long time ago, but anyway. Um, well, and, and one uh, interesting point about that is hmm. is um you know in in terms of in terms of kind of Justin specifically and and the long history Justin was not unique in his search there's there's a long long history that goes back centuries of people who have looked to that country as this place of of answers and yeah. and I think one question that a lot of people hold is you know we've all or many people have read Siddhartha and are familiar with the story of the Buddha uh, but many, many other people, celebrities from Steve Jobs to Julia Roberts and, and hundreds of others, I think a lot of people go with this question of, well, if they experience that uh, some kind of enlightening moment, uh, why can't I? And I think that is, is largely the, the kind of spark that can turn into a fire for somebody to pack a backpack and buy a plane ticket and set off there on, on some kind of journey to, to find themselves or to find that enlightening moment is right. so many people have come before me, so many people have achieved and attained what they hoped, uh, why can't I? Right, right. Right, and it's also, of course, there's, there's so much in the media and you know, popular culture uh, about this aspect of India. Um, okay, um, so coming back to Justin a little bit again, um, Another, another conflict that, that I think you mentioned a couple of times is also his sort of conflict with sort of maintaining solid relationships since, because mm -hmm. of the fact that he was on the road constantly, right? Um, so also, can you speak a little bit about this? He was, he was terrified of losing his freedom, but he also spoke about you know, his constant loneliness. 
uh, which is something that I'm sure all travelers, you know, who travel, who are on the road constantly face, right? Uh, yeah. Can you speak to that a little bit? I think you're right. I think it is something that particularly people who are more interested or pursue kind of solo independent travel is, you know, there's a lot of people that find comfort in groups and find comfort in, in a partner or, or a best friend traveling with them. And, and that's lovely. Um, but I think for that one particular group of people who, who see travel as a way to really dig into something in themselves and see solitude and independence um, as the way to, to achieve that. I think for that group, there is always going to be this notion uh, or this conflict of, I want that, I want that independence. I want to learn on my own. I want to make decisions on my own. And that's something that people, you know, when you're, in, in, when you're a kid growing up and you're a teenager, your parents are largely making the decisions for you about, you know, you know what you can eat and where you can go to school and all those types of things. And, and you know, to that kind of liberation that you get in your early 20s, uh, leaving the home, leaving your household, leaving your family, um, and setting out on your own is an enormous moment for a lot of people. And I think they relish in that independent, uh, independence and that kind of uh, single-minded uh, thinking, which is, which is a very lovely thing and a very positive thing. And so many wonderful things can come out of that. But I think it also brings up a lot of notions of uh, that we are all social creatures, that we are people that exist in a community or in a culture or in a small town or in a big city, and we are all part of something bigger than ourselves. It's very, very, very challenging to be completely on your own in this world. And I think Justin really struggled with that. And I think partly it had to do with, um, you know, coming from a household that split up early. I think he was constantly trying to seek connection in people and, and particularly connection that lasted uh, longer than, than, uh, than some of his other early relationships did. And because he moved around so much as a kid, he never really was able to establish those kind of long, lifelong 20 year friendships that, that a lot of kids do uh, mm -hmm. growing up. And so his, his, I think a large part of his, his searching and his, his sort of later 20s and early 30s was about trying to find connection in a lot of different ways. And in a large part, it was connection to a place, to, to nature. In a huge part, it was connection to something bigger than himself, whether he, he thought that was God or Shiva or mother nature or, or what have you. But I think a large part also was um, finding that kind of deep, profound connection with people. And he, in some ways, found that online, um, as fleeting and as fragmented as that as that is, mm. but he also found that in a lot of relationships that he had um, over the years that, you know, he had a couple kind of longer romantic relationships, but, um, but for the most part valued that independence more than anything stable. And, you know, one relationship he had was, this, was with this woman who had a, had a young boy and was very, very kind of stable and grounded and, and you know, not chaotic. Yeah. And he, was torn between this life that he admired so much uh, in this person and that kind of stability and comfort that comes from that and connection while also knew that his feet were going to itch and that independence that he always wanted uh, was going to rear, rear its head again. Um, and I think that was, a, that, was a, that was a conflict throughout his life and particularly when he traveled. Um, mm -hmm. And you can kind of see it sometimes. He stopped for uh, for places in places for a lot longer than a typical tourist would. Um, mm -hmm. He really spent time in places. And then, you know, he returned to this one village in Thailand that he initially went in, to in 2006 and kind of was adopted into this family. Uh, he returned again and again, many, many times to this one place to try to find that kind of deep connection wherever he could. Right, right, yeah. And, and so also another tension between which you know which existed very strongly in him was the sort of the tension between the the material and tangible and the non-material and spiritual right so could you speak a little bit about this and also his relationship with money and and that one specific phase in his life uh, where he made a lot of it yeah he he was somebody who uh i think he really valued certain kind of objects that he surrounded himself with um 
you know, his, his journals, um, but also, you know, ne never really wanted to feel bound by the things that he, he possessed or the things that he, he accumulated over the years. Mm. And there, one phase in his life, the phase that you mentioned, he was kind of one of his biggest transformations. He had been living in San Francisco, uh, in California, um, and had, you know, quit this, this job working as, as a mentor at this youth school and moved to, uh, back to Florida to Miami to work for this tech startup as kind of the traveling uh, face uh, of this company. And, and as you said, did very, very well there and, and built up a nest egg, but also enjoyed a very kind of glamorous life. You know, was living in this apartment in South Beach, you know, wearing Armani suits, um, traveling the world and staying in fancy hotels and, and building up a lot of, a, a lot of money. But I, I think even at the very beginning and, and, you know, I was, I was fortunate to, to be given a few of his, his, his personal journals at that time. And one that I was, I was allowed to include in the book was written during that time. And it was really, I think he was aware, even during that three year period, uh, working at that, that tech job was aware that it was a means to an end, was aware that he just had to kind of do it to be able to afford the life that he truly wanted and had always wanted. And the problem is that people have a complicated relationship with money because we all need it in some capacity to live and to, to fulfill our dreams in some way, but we all don't really want it to be that thing. We don't want it yeah. to be as, as important as it is. And so Justin, when he ultimately quit this, that job and gave away everything, gave away all his Armani suits, gave up his apartment and packed a small day pack and hopped on his motorcycle and, and began this three year, uh, um, you know, indefinite journey. He had this nest egg that, that fueled those experiences, but he also didn't want it to be, uh, it didn't want it to be the constraint that, that money often is. And so he gave a lot of it away. He supported uh, development organizations in Nepal that, he, that were very close to his heart and in some ways knew that he needed money to, to fulfill these dreams, but also, you know, gave it away to, to almost put himself in a position that was more challenging, mm -hmm. that, was, that was, you know, austere by design. Right. And I think that was a really interesting uh, notion about him is that he, yes, he sought the extreme experiences, but he also really wanted to put himself into extreme experiences, which was not just on a high mountain um, or, you know, trekking into the bush with no cell reception uh, and coming out two weeks later, but not ha necessarily having the means or having to figure it out, having to problem solve um, mm -hmm. with not a lot of money. And mm -hmm. so he, it was a, it was a constant, constant um, uh, conflict within him about, about having it and also not really wanting to have it. Right, right. Um, another kind of conflict that I, I sensed with Justin, where you, you sort of mentioned it towards the end and you mention it uh, very, I mean, you don't mention it too much, but you just hint at it is sort of his conflict with his masculinity, right? Um, you know, uh, it's basically he, the way I see it, I mean, I've, I've gone on his Instagram account, etc. And it seems like he projected quite a kind of a hyper masculine version of himself. You know, he was always well ripped without t-shirts, etc. Um, but also um, given given his childhood and all that he experienced it, do you think this was a kind of a mask? Uh, and, and also his feelings about shame that you mentioned uh, quite a bit in the book um, uh, was a lot of his mo motivation for adventure sort of trying to cover his sort of shame that he felt and to prove that he was not vulnerable? I, I absolutely I think that a large part of it was was a mask. And, you know, we all kind of put on masks based on, on our own personal history and how we want to be perceived by others. And I think Justin, you know, in the early part of his life, uh, did throw himself into very hyper-masculine environments. Um, you know, this kind of survival school that he went to was, it was a very kind of boys driven place. Mm -hmm. And, but he also at one point wanted to join, you know, the, the U S Marines mm -hmm. and train for that and spent a lot of time at the gym and was a very, you know, was immersed himself into a lot of very masculine situations and pursued a lot of things 
and I think when you, on the surface, it kind of appears quite superficial when you just do kind of a cursory look at, at his Instagram page, you know, you can almost kind of roll your eyes at how many shirtless pictures he's, he's posted. Yeah. But I think he wanted to project that to people as a way to cover up some, some things that were boiling uh, deep within. And I mentioned some of those things in the book and he had a very, very hard and, and very dark and traumatic uh, couple events when he was uh, a boy um, and, and when he was a teenager that I think in a lot of ways marked uh, his life afterwards. Um, and I think by putting on that hyper-masculine uh, persona, that hyper-masculine mask, was a way to kind of cover up and to show people that he wasn't um, hurt. He wasn't, he wasn't damaged by these really, really terrible things that, that happened to him that I mentioned in the book. Um, and as a way to kind of show that th those things weren't the things that were going to define him, um, that he had overcome them and that he has, they had the capability to, to make sure that nothing like that would ever happen to him again. Mm. But also, also as a way to kind of be this protective shield that he had the capability to, to defend himself or to get himself out of a situation because he was fit and strong. Um, and the, you know, the, the tragic irony of, of all that is that in the end, Justin didn't come through his final journey. And in the end, he could do everything he possibly could to try to to try to build himself up as somebody who was strong and fit. But ultimately he was somebody who like a lot of us um, are very vulnerable and are very, you know, I started doing a lot of kind of more intimate interviews for the book with close friends and family. He was in so many ways so different from how he presented himself on Instagram. He was much more, uh, much, much softer, um, much kinder than he, than he appeared as, you know, someone without his shirt on riding a motorcycle um, and much more thoughtful and much deeper um, but also much more vulnerable. And, and so he, again, it was one of these, another expression of him occupying these two worlds as somebody who was fit and strong and capable and, and you know, chest puffed out. Uh, and then behind the scenes was somebody who was deeply kind of brooding and, and questioning um, and, and uncertain and deeply, deeply vulnerable, I think. Mm. Right. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the travelers who met him as well thought that he was a lot shyer, right. In person than uh, what he appeared on Instagram. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we have about five minutes left, I think. So I, I we just conclude a little bit. And um, so it's, I, I felt that it was, you know, it's a sad, it's a dark story. Um, but, but I mean, it's amazing that the, the fact that his Instagram account and Facebook page and all of that still exists today. And, people are around the world, you know, are still inspired by him, are still inspired by his life. And hopefully your book will introduce a lot more people to him um, and sort of spread the message that emanated from his being, right? Which was that he was sort of hungry to experience the, the rawness of life and he pursued it. He didn't hold back at all. He pursued mm -hmm. it, you know, with open arms. Um, so just at the end, I wanted to ask you, where, where do you believe Justin is today? Yeah, that's, I mean... That's kind of the big question. And yeah. I think, you know, when Justin disappeared, um, he embarked on this trek with the sadhu and the sadhu returned and, and Justin did not. And when he disappeared, there were a number of theories that came out of the woodwork um, in, in the months afterwards and in the years afterwards that I, you know, listened to and, and really tried to kind of investigate uh, to the fullest that I could. And some of the theories were uh, murder, some of the theories were accident. Some of the theories uh, were slightly more esoteric. Um, but one of them is that because India has this long history of people who've gone there, forsaken their belongings, found their own path in that specific country and are still out there, and but have cut all ties with the rest of the world, but are still out there. I think I wanted to at least end the book on a very kind of hopeful note. Because this, as you said, it is a very dark and a very kind of tragic story. And it, it is a tragedy at its heart that, that somebody is missing and presumed dead. But there was, you know, not to give too much away, but there, 
I love that this story ends, and I love that Justin's story ends on a slightly more hopeful note, that potentially he did find what he was looking for, that potentially he did get to the end of this journey at Mansalai Lake, deep in the Parvati Valley, you know, at the source of this holy river, in the company of a sadhu who gave him the path, but he found that destination and had that kind of illuminating moment that he long sought. I, I hope that he found that moment of transformation, of awakening. And of course, you know, so many people I spoke to, even years after Justin disappeared, were still holding on to that hope that he is, he found what he was looking for and he's still out there wandering. Um, and I think that, you know, I would love to believe that as well. I think, you know, it's some of the evidence that I present in the book uh, complicates that possibility and, and, and questions that possibility. But I also, in some way, in a lot of ways, kind of love the fact that his story ends, uh, that the journey kind of continues and that people, as you said, can still go to his social media accounts and still be inspired. And even, you know, not that long ago, while I was working on this book, long after Justin disappeared, people were still posting on his page like he was still alive. And I think that is kind of a lovely notion that he, even in death, he is still, even in possible death, uh, he is still inspiring people. And, and so I, that was kind of the note that I wanted to, to leave readers with is that, you know, his journey and his story was ultimately about finding the positivity in the world and really being deeply hopeful about what his, his journey could be and what the end of it could, could, could offer him. And, and I hope the book kind of reflects that, uh, that in the end. Yeah, absolutely. I, 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 think, I think it ends absolutely on that note. Um, okay, I think we have to end as well. So thanks so much. It was, it's a fascinating book. Um, like I mentioned, so painstakingly detailed and so well put together. Um, and it's been a fascinating conversation. So thanks so much, Ali. Thank you so much for having me. It's been my absolute pleasure. Thank you, Harley and Anisha, for a thought-provoking conversation on Shetla's ill-fated expedition and the dark side of the Himalayas. Thank you all for watching and being such a great audience. Please stay logged on to continue to watch with us the series of exciting sessions featuring a stellar list of speakers that have been specially curated for you. Sessions are ongoing across all three of our venues, Front Lawn, Mughal Tent, and Darbar Hall. These sessions are followed by the writer's shots, so please stay logged in.